And now, please welcome APTA President and CEO, Paul Scatellis. Good afternoon. How are y'all doing? We're not wearing yet, are we? I hope you're having a great conference. It's really been a terrific uh, morning and, and early afternoon already, and I hope you were over at the showcase as well. Well, welcome to this session, Priorities and Perspectives from our Federal Partners. Uh, and certainly, from our industry's perspective, two of the most important partners are the Federal Transit Administration and the Federal Railroad Administration. First, I want to welcome the Acting Administrator for FTA, Jane Williams. She's a great friend of APTA and our public transportation industry. Uh, she's incredible in terms of the time and, and commitment she's given to our industry, virtually at every meeting, every conference, always available, uh, not only to come and appear, as she's doing here today at the conference, but I know meeting with many of you. I don't know how she finds the time to do it all, but, Jane, we really do appreciate it. Uh, and so we've got lots, uh, lots to hear from uh, the administrator, and also perhaps we'll have an opportunity to to do a little Q&A as well. Uh, so many of you, I think, know a lot about Jane's background. She's been uh, in government for many years, has served in, in the prior administration uh, with uh, George H.W. Bush. Uh, she's worked at the local and state government level, at the federal level. She understands how government works. She understands the importance of public transportation uh, to communities. And we know that she manages an incredibly complex program, $13.5 billion that her organization is responsible for 3,000 transit providers, uh, all of you in the audience here who, at the agency side, very much rely on the federal dollars to keep your operations and your capital programs moving forward, and in all 50 states in the U.S. territory. So the FTA uh, and Jane's organization has tremendous responsibility that we're very appreciative for the work that she does. Before we welcome Jane to the stage, let's please take a look here at a brief video depicting FTA's recent work to support our industry and public transportation. Love that video. Please welcome Acting Administrator Jane Williams. That is very well done. I love that video. Thank you, uh, Paul, and uh, thank you to my staff that is in-house that actually produced that video. They are an amazing team that we have at FTA. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you today um, to continue to advance our very productive partnership with APTA and FTA. And I'm also very glad to be here in Toronto with you. Canada is a valuable trading partner for the U.S. and a tremendous partner in advancing transit, too. I hope many of you have taken the opportunity to ride the commuter rail system, the subway system, and the streetcar like I have while you've been here in Toronto. Joining me is FTA Chief Counsel John Brennan, 
who was appointed last spring, as well as Chief Safety Officer Henrika Buchanan, and the head of FTA's grants office, Bruce Robertson. I hope you enjoyed this video, and it shows just how active our staff has been. And before I take your questions, I wanted to take just a few minutes to talk a little bit about what we've done in the three top priorities for our secretary, Elaine Chow. Infrastructure investment, innovation, and of course safety is always our number one goal. Let me start with our most recent effort to partner with you to promote safety across the entire industry. We achieved a tremendous milestone on our collective safety efforts when FTA certified all 31 final state safety oversight agencies in March, well ahead of the April 2019 deadline. This certification allowed us to transfer responsibility for direct safety oversight of the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority Metrorail system to the Washington Metrorail Safety Commission after four years. As you all know, I come from Maryland, I come out of MDOT, and that is near and dear to my heart that we were able to make that transfer. And so relinquishing that direct oversight role and seeing all states achieve certification is just a tremendous accomplishment. You know, when I began there um, at FTA back in August of 17, we did not have one certified program stood up. And so now with your partnership, we were successful in getting all 31 done and across the finish line before that deadline. So now we are focused on helping you reach another important milestone, and that's the compliance with the Public Transportation Agency Safety Plan Rule, we like to call PTASP. It requires you to integrate the principles and processes in safety management systems into your safety plans. It creates a foundation to change safety culture from top to bottom to better manage your agency's safety risks. And one important aspect of PTAPS is the rules flexibility in allowing you to design your safety program in whatever way works best for you. You know, I've said it many times, when you've seen one transit system, you've seen one transit system. FTA is hosting many different ways to help partner with you to meet this milestone, including webinars, conferences, uh, summer workshops, fall workshops, and locations all across the country. So please uh, participate in those and let us know how, what other resources that you need and how we can help make sure that we get you across the finish line. One of the issues you know, that continues to stay front and center for all of us is the challenge of keeping transit assets in a state of good repair. And we recognize the overwhelming needs across the nation. And in rail in particular, given that 23% of rail transit assets are considered in marginal or poor condition. That's why at FTA, we continue to provide support from dozens of hands-on resources posted on our website, in-person meetings, and in conferences. Our transit asset management webinars, trainings, peer exchanges, and roundtables have attracted more than 3,400 people in the last two and a half years alone and we are committed to continuing to provide the industry with additional technical assistance. As we are collecting asset management success stories too, let me talk to you a little bit about MARTA in Atlanta. They've been improving the accuracy of their data and developing new performance indicators and engaging staff across the agency in asset management implementation. Their work paid off a lot earlier this year when they became the very first transit agency to achieve a prestigious certification for its asset management program from the International Organization for Standardization, which sets global standards for industries worldwide. As I've said since the beginning of my tenure at FTA, we want to be your partner. And state of good repair efforts are no different. Like you saw in the video, we have provided significant funding for SGR, more than three billion in fact, for rail projects alone since 2017. This administration has signaled increased support for public transportation in the president's most recent fiscal year 2020 budget request, which includes a billion dollars in additional funding for key programs from the general fund. This proposal also includes 500 million in capital investment grants for new projects that may become available in FY 2020. It includes 250 million in state of good repair efforts, as well as 250 million in bus and bus facilities infrastructure investments. 
And so I wanted to make sure that this uh, was recognized as we continue as an administration to recognize our investment and the importance of that in our aging infrastructure. The President budgets requests $12.4 billion to bring transit infrastructure into a state of good repair and strengthen transit safety oversight. $10.2 billion will be dedicated for transit formula grants consistent with the fifth year of the FAST Act authorized funding levels. And as we are continuing to support the rail industry with significant capital investment, just last week we signed a $74.1 million grant with the Metro Transit for construction of the Metro Orange Line bus rapid transit project in Minneapolis. This 17 mile long BRT line will improve mobility and transit service in the region's busiest corridor, connecting people to major job centers downtown, including the headquarters of Target, Best Buy, and U.S. Bank. We also announced last week that we're moving forward with BART's Transbay Corridor Core Capacity Project, which will move into the engineering phase of our capital investment grant program and receive a $300 million funding allocation. The project will help build capacity between the city of Oakland and downtown San Francisco, and it will receive this initial payment once we get through the full funding grant agreement, hopefully before the end of the year. In March, we announced additional funding of $1.36 billion, which included funding allocations to 16 different projects, 11 of which that have existing grant agreements, and five new CIG projects that are coming to readiness to receive a grant agreement. With that latest round of allocations, FTA has advanced 23 new CIG projects throughout the nation since January 17, totaling approximately $6.3 billion in investment. In fact, when I leave this conference, I'll be traveling to Dallas to sign another full funding grant agreement, but tune in later for more on that this week. As you can see, FTA continues to advance projects through the CIG program in accordance with the law, and as projects meet the readiness requirements, they're funded on their individual merits. That being said, I want to continue to emphasize that FTA is more than just CIG. With that in mind, I wanted to just take a, a brief moment and let you know that we are moving ahead with our expedited project delivery program. This program, as you know, it, it helps collaboration between public and private sectors um, to help leverage support from the federal government with 25% of the federal government share. And we are happy to know that we had seven expressions of interest from four different transit agencies. Uh, we are continuing to work with all seven projects for transit agencies, but we are happy to announce today that we are moving forward with Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority in San Jose <laughs> for, for the uh, BART Silicon Valley Phase Two project. And Nuria has been an incredible partner. Uh, this project um, is, is one that's very innovative, and so we're very excited to move to the next level with, uh, with Nuria and her team and that project. And so we, we are making, uh, making progress. It, it is a program that you know, had a lot of challenges. Uh, a lot of people want to make it CIG, but they want it done in four months, and quite frankly, that's impossible, as many of you know. So. Let me just uh, take a, a minute and just talk to you a little bit about what we've done in innovation, which is another priority for the Secretary. Uh, as you know, we just recently did our ICAM grants for $9.6 million. That's our Access and Mobility Partnership Program, and it supports technology innovation, and I think there's so much more we can be doing in transit in that area, and so we were very happy to provide a lot of support to do uh, additional research to see. In fact, in San Diego, we, uh, the Metropolitan Transit System there, were, they were using a phone system to do their paratransit service. And it, we actually were able to partner with them um, with just a small amount of money, $536,000, to set up a new system that would offer an online and voice prompting reservation service that was 24 hours a day. And it made it easier for riders to reserve trips online, and to ultimately have better access to care. Just last month, you know, we, we announced our Innovative Mobility Initiative, or we like to call it IMI. It's a $15 million NOFO that is out right now. 
We're asking for your expressions of interest and in, uh, your projects by August 6th. Um, that is another way that you can use technology and leverage it, uh, whether it's uh, the Mobility on Demand Initiative, round two, uh, it's also transit automation, and it's also the integrated fair payment part. Um, for instance, uh, out in BART, they did a very interesting parking uh, in, in our first round of mod uh, de demand grants, and it was, it was great. They partnered people that were coming in uh, and needed a place to park. They would arrive at the station with nowhere to park. So they created an app for people to figure out who was coming at the same time they were. They shared the ride. If you shared a ride, you were guaranteed a spot. And it's, it, they started in one station, now it's at 17 stations, and they've matched 100,000 trips. Now that's incredible, that, that's the kind of leverage that we can bring to the table. And so we're very excited about that progress um, that we've been making. Um, you know, closer to home, I always have to talk about, you know, the nation's capital, USDOT sits at the Navy Yard. And uh, WMATA, with a $77,000 original investment from FTA years ago, just sold the property to a developer who's going to put a 10-story building on this land where they had their air conditioning facility. And they're moving that facility now on the roof of a 10-story building. And as a result, they're going to realize 150 times that initial investment in return. And that's that's the kind of leverage and the kind of collaboration we want to make sure that we have with you. Um, you know, the last one I want to give you is something that um, I did more re recently in um, Philadelphia with Jeff Knuppel when I went and saw the 30th Street um, station there in Philadelphia, which I grew up in Northeastern Maryland, so it's, it's closer to home. I follow the Phillies, sorry, Nat fans and the like. But I grew up in that area, and so seeing that station and bringing private investment in and really making um, better connections for that neighborhood is so important. And so I want to thank Jeff for touring me through that that's the station that's there now and seeing the plans on how that will develop in the future. And so on that, I'd like to just thank you once again for your partnership. You know, it's incredibly important, the work that we do every day. People rely on us for safe, reliable, efficient transportation to get to where they need to be. And we can't do it without each other. So thank you for your partnership. And I think uh, Paul's going to join me on stage, and we're going to take some questions. Jane, thank you so much. We appreciate the, uh, the comments and, uh, and also your willingness to take a couple questions here. I think I'm going to start it off maybe with a couple questions, and then we'll look to the audience. So if you've got a question or two that you're thinking about, now's the time to, to begin to formulate that in your mind. But let me just say, first of all, how much we appreciate your presence, but also the presence of your team. And, and that makes it, quite frankly, that much more special for all of us as we get a chance to interact during the course of events like this. So I have the best team. You've got a I great really team. I really, truly do. Uh, Jane, let me start it off then with uh, something that is important to the industry. You recognize it, and you touched on it, of course, in your remarks, and that is the capital investment grants. Uh, you know that many of our uh, agencies really rely on CIG for BRT projects, for new starts, uh, and even core capacity projects. And, of course, it continues to be, amongst our priorities, one of the top priorities. So state of good repair, I would say, for our established systems is certainly at the top of the heap but CIG is right there as well in terms of allowing communities to be able to continue to grow and expand their networks. And so I wonder if you'd elaborate a little bit more on CIG, the President's Fiscal Year 2020 budget request, um, anything that you would feel comfortable sharing with us in terms of the administrations and your views vis-a-vis -vis CIG. Yeah, I think, you know, in, in prior year budgets, uh, the, the administration didn't request any additional funding. Uh, for the capital investment grant program. And I think you see in this budget um, a, a turn from that policy and that we recognize that there, it's important. Transit infrastructure uh, investment is also important across our country. Uh, the $500 million in that uh, line is, is extremely important. And it came from the general fund, which uh, for those of you that don't reside in Washington, D.C., and words, you know, kind of get you know, misdefined sometimes, the general fund competes against every other department, agency, program in the entire government. 
And so to have a billion dollars be taken out of the general fund and put into transit is a big deal. The other 500 million of that billion dollar investment that's not in the capital investment grant line is also uh, dedicated to infrastructure investment. 250 million of it will be for bus and bus facilities. That'll be a competitive program. We recognize there's a lot of bus, a third of our bus fleets are gonna be out aged. And so we need to make sure that we're constantly looking at that investment as well. And then the other 250 million is for state of good repair and that'll be a formula program. Um, we wanna make sure that we're taking care of the assets we have um, with, with also managing when we need to have additional extensions. So I think it's an important balance that we have to strike and I think that's the, the message the President's budget was trying to carry forward. And Jane, thank you for that because I think as an industry we do recognize uh, that there has been a, a recognition uh, of the merits of CIG and the importance uh, to the community. So, so thanks for that, that development. And, and before I leave CIG, can I just, where is Beth Day? Beth Day, stand up and just take a bow. Because let me just tell you, her job is a hard one. Um, she deals with, <laughs> oh, and she did the curtsy. Uh, <laughs> very nice. Uh, no, but it, all kidding aside, Beth has a very difficult job. You know, when I came into the department, people said, you know, CIG is about 20% of your budget. It'll take 80% of your time. They were not kidding. Um, if I had to spend a, almost 100% of my time like Beth does, I'm not sure I could survive it. Um, and she does it very, very well. And uh, many of the requests we get through the media, uh, through Capitol Hill, go through her office. And she's the one that's managing all 60 projects, along with our very capable Bruce uh, Robinson and TPM. Um, they, they are the workhorses in our, in our um, offices that put those projects forward, and it's an incredible amount of work. So I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank her as we talk about CIG. And, and Jane, I, I can um, make a personal testimonial. In my many years back, having been on the agency side and having come to FTA knocking on the door saying, can we talk about this project? Um, and Beth was there at the time as well amongst other your staff. Always very professional, always very helpful. Uh, so oftentimes tough questions, but that's of course the nature of the business that we're all in, right? But so we very much appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Beth. Um, another question, uh, a top priority certainly for FTA, I know, and at APTA as well in our industry is safety. Uh, and over this past year, uh, you've managed uh, with uh, your leadership and FTA staff to make sure that state, uh, state safety oversight agencies uh, have met their requirements uh, and met them by the due date. Uh, and I know that was a concern for you. Every meeting you would speak to that issue. So with that one now behind us, and I know we feel very good about that, what's the next priority relative to safety for FTA? So let me start by thanking Henrique Buchanan, our now chief safety officer, no longer acting in front of that title. She managed that effort for me. Um, coming out of the state of Maryland and dealing with that from the WMATA compact side was a huge challenge for us. We had the most complex uh, set of circumstances and had our, you know, our funding withheld. And so I was really concerned when I came in that I wanted to make sure that we were a partner, that I never wanted to be a roadblock, that I wanted to be the one reaching the hand out and pulling people across the finish line, not trying to block them from getting across the finish line. So we put together an entire, um, you know, guideline to say, we want to message every single time. You're not wrong when I say it was in every speech I gave. Even if it didn't have a safety focus, it was in it. And safety is Secretary Chow's number one priority. And so not being able to meet this milestone was just not an option for us. And so I had the uh, ability to work with Henrika very early in my tenure. And I saw her management and her leadership. And so I asked her if she would be willing to take on that assignment for us. And she did it willingly. Um, and she's done a phenomenal job of getting everyone and partnering with you to get everyone across the finish line, all 31, including you know, the most difficult one, the WMSC. Uh, uh, stood up and the Direct Safety Authority now, you know, not, no longer residing in FTA. And so that was an incredible milestone for us and I'm just very happy uh, with, with what we've been able to accomplish on the safety side. That being said, we moved to the Public Transportation Safety Plan requirement that's July 20th of 2020. And we, what I want to reassure you is that she is also leading that effort and we would expect the same partnership moving through that process as well. And we know that this is new, and uh, when new things happen, it, it's a learning uh, 
culture and a learning challenge, but we wanna make sure that we partner with you to get everyone across the finish line by that deadline. And so we've done webinars, we've been here presenting, we, we go to all the different APTA meetings to present. Uh, we're, we're going on a, a tour, Candice K is doing a lot of this for us. Um, you know, we'll be all over the United States with uh, seminars to make sure that everybody understands what the requirements are and can meet the milestones. So that's our next big focus. Okay. Thank you, Jane and Henrika, thank you. All right, let's open it up. Um, a question or two for the administrator? Here's our chance, and there's a room full here, so I can't imagine that there won't be a few questions, but... I have don't been be, here don't, a lot with don't questions be bashful. earlier, but... Here we go. Can you please just announce who you are and uh, your organization? Uh, yes, my name is uh, my name is Eric Madison. Uh, I am with uh, Dovetail Consulting uh, of Atlanta, Georgia, and I actually used to I work at you. FTA. So, um, hi. hi. Uh, so my question is really about um, with the implementation of the PTAS because this is the next big push, but also kind of reiterating the importance of the SSOs of keeping their certification under 674. Uh, because I know that that was a you know, huge effort, but also kind of making the case that as, as the uh, transit agencies transition over to the PTAS rule, that there's still the message from the FTA to encourage uh, the leadership within the states to support their state safety oversight agencies as they kind of guide the uh, transit agencies through this process as well. So is there, because um, I know we have the uh, workshop coming up in the fall, uh, will there potentially be a, a possible message just to kind of, you know, because you've got everybody in the room at that point to kind of reiterate that message? Oh, absolutely. We would expect nothing less. I mean, we would continue that partnership and that collaboration, um, you know, throughout each of the states with each of the transit agencies. What Eric's not telling you, and I think I can see you, Eric, in your former FTA uh, hat there uh, isn't quite on your head any longer, but... Um, no, what Eric is not saying is he used to serve in FTA on this effort that we just talked about with the SSOAs and, and was a big part of that success. So um, thank you for what you've done. I didn't see you in the audience. Um, but no, we would, would, we would expect the same collaboration and the same support. I know that we stopped doing some of the audits while we were standing up the SSOAs because we thought it was confusing to audit against something that was aging and where we were trying to put into place a new structure. And so now that we're ramping up to get back to our auditing function, we will take that into consideration. And so we'll have, you know, Henrika is very good at her leadership and I know that there'll be some that will be maybe finished and some that won't. Mm -hmm. And we'll recognize that as we go through the process. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, good to see you, Eric. <laughs> okay, another question. Make a mad dash to the mic. Here we go. Think. Anybody have questions for Paul? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're wrapping it up now. <laughs> Hi, my name is, please, Derek Watcher. I'm with Wilson Eerig. We're a small specialty sub that does uh, noise vibration control for transit. <clears throat> and I had the pleasure of seeing Administrator Williams yesterday at the Capital Programs session. Appreciate that. And one of the quotes you said was that you one of your goals here this week is to dispel some myths, which I really appreciate, also appreciate. And I wanted you to address this. This is just something that I had read a while back, and, and I was hoping you can elaborate on it. And, and again, if it's a myth or a misstep, if you could just sort of enlighten us all. But one of the quotes was in uh, there was an FTA document that said future investments in new transit projects would be funded by localities that use and benefit from the localized projects implying that, that funding should be primarily local and, and not, mm -hmm. you know, th there's this idea of what is the role of the federal government in funding transit projects, even in large metropolitan areas like mm -hmm. Atlanta and San Francisco. I so think you, you may be referring to a document, um, are you referring to the budget? Uh, the 19, the 18 and 19 budgets? I believe so. I think so. that's where the language uh, was. And I can tell you in FY 2020, it is not there any longer. So that is not okay. So that has been reversed, and we're back on back on track. It's not it only been reversed; it's been deleted from the document. That's very good to hear. That's a great myth to just. Well, I don't, apparently, it wasn't a myth; it was a fact. But now it's been now it's been uh, uh, reversed, and now now we're Spelled. back to funding. Thank you for that, You're Administrator. Welcome. I appreciate that. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Thank you. We have time for one more question over here. Hi, uh, my name is Chris Lehman. I work for ATS Consulting. We're also 
noise and vibration consultants um, for the rail industry. Uh, my, my question is, I was wondering if I could get just some general comments on the FTA's level of concern um, for climate change and its, a, and its threat to uh, infrastructure assets and what they might be doing about that. Well, our level of concern, I mean, we do the conditions and performance uh, every two years, I believe it is, and we're getting ready to produce that report, and that will have some statistics uh, for the 10-year uh, snapshot in time. Um, some of that will be on emissions and how the bus and electric uh, battery power market has kind of changed some of that. Uh, the next iteration will be out probably of that report will be out in a year or so, and I think you'll see a change in those statistics because of the introduction of those buses, which FTA prior to our administration really supported um, that technology moving forward into the into the industry. And so I think you'll you'll see a, a greater uh, impact um, on global global climate change in that report when it comes out. Thank you. Okay. Is there another question? I see someone walking. All right. Is there a question? No, looking for a seat. Okay. Well, Jane, maybe so one. None for maybe, Paul. Maybe one quick one for. Here, we have one more, I guess. Okay, I'll okay. ask a question. Right. And uh, my name is Ray Chambers. I'm the president of a small association of independent passenger rail operators, and we run about a quarter of a million trains over your various agencies around the country each year. Uh, we have a real interest in in uh, expanding the private marketplace and competition. And uh, we are, have a real interest in the, uh, what we call the state-supported routes, which is a, more of an FRA responsibility. Uh, there are 38 of them. There's 19 states subsidizing, subsidizing them. They're all under contract with Amtrak except one, which is under contract to Herzog. And it's become clear to me, as we're getting into this, that those trains run by the states and commuter railroads are very, very similar. Yet, you know, we got trains, we got tracks, we got stations, and we don't go too far, at least under 750 miles. But there's a real lack of coordination between the FRA and the FTA, who has the responsibilities. You do a great job of getting out money, they do a pretty good job in safety, and it seems to me that we need a more coordinated effort for passenger rail, for urban passenger rail generally. I know that, um both John Brennan and myself sit on the Northeast Corridor Commission, and uh, we are in the process of working through that, uh, that issue, the issues that we have there with passenger rail tr transportation. Um, FTA, you need to understand, is early in its journey in safety. Uh, we have been a grant-making agency forever. Uh, we know how to make grants and do the oversight of those very, very well, I would argue, better than most. Uh, if not everyone, but we're, we're still early on the safety side. In FRAs, uh, they're the opposite. So they've been regulating rail since forever, way before any of us were even here. And so they know how to do regulatory stuff. They're learning how to do the, the grant making stuff. And so we, we collaborate well with them. Um, you know, they're our agency and I would say, you know, you have them, I think, coming up after me. Um, you know, but know that we are working with Amtrak. We have started with the Northeast Corridor um, and trying to work through some of the issues we have there as one of the busiest passenger rail networks in the country. Good answer, and my only comment would be, I think there needs to be more intense cooperation on those issues into the future. Okay, I appreciate the comment. Okay, with that, we're gonna wrap it up. Jane, thank you so much. We really appreciate you being here with us your presentation earlier, and also your willingness to take some Q&A. We sure, appreciate that absolutely. very much. And thanks to you and your team for being here. Thank you. Thank you again. And uh, now we're ready for our second half of our federal partnerships, and that is with the FRA, Federal Railroad Administration. Um, and I'd like to ask uh, Jeff Knuppel to introduce our next federal partner. Uh, Jeff is well known to many of you. He's the general manager of the Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority, known as SEPTA. Uh, he's also a member of our board of directors and really one of the most engaged members. Um, we were talking earlier just uh, a few moments ago, and he said, geez, you just had me convene three different committee meetings, and I'm off to a fourth presentation. And so, Jeff, that's the way we like it. We like to keep our members really busy. 
Uh, and, and quite frankly, it's, it's you as the members who have a lot of expertise that we think should be shared more widely. But in Jeff's role at SEPTA, he oversees 9,300 employees uh, at what is the nation's sixth largest transportation agency. Uh, 31 years that he's been at SEPTA. He started on the infrastructure side and was made chief engineer at the ripe old age of 36. Uh, during the past year, Jeff successfully led APTA's efforts to help all commuter rail systems get over that December 2018 milestone threshold. And now we're focused on bringing everybody along and making sure that as an industry, we can meet the PTC requirements for full operational status uh, by the end of 2020. So he's a great asset to our industry and to APTA. Let's please welcome Jeff Knuppel. All right, I was a little bit afraid because at one point in time, my workforce referred to me as Darth Vader, so I didn't know what the music would be. It's a little nervous. All right, and thank you for those kind words, Paul. I have the pleasure and honor of introducing Carl Alexi, the Acting Associate Administrator for Railroad Safety and Chief Safety Officer for the Federal Railroad Administration. Mr. Alexi plays a critical role in the work our agencies do to serve the public. He began his career in DuPont's Logistics Group, where he oversaw design, construction, and modification of all of DuPont's tank car, intermodal tank, and cargo tank fleet used to transport hazardous materials. Mr. Alexi joined FRA in 2009 as a general engineer in the Hazardous Materials Division in FRA's Office of Safety. In 2012, he was named Staff Director of the Hazardous Materials Division and then promoted in 2015 to the Director of the Office of Safety Analysis, overseeing seven FRA divisions that guide the rail industry's risk mitigation efforts. In 2018, Mr. Alexi was appointed Deputy Associate Administrator he leads the Office of Safety Analysis, the Office of Technical Oversight, and Regional Operations, all of which are vital to what we do every day. Please welcome FRA Acting Associate Administrator, Carl Alexi. Good afternoon, everyone. When, uh, when Ron Vittori asked for me to come in his stead, he didn't tell me FTA was going to have a video. So I'm... <laughs> Maybe next year. Uh, but Ron, Ron does uh, send his regrets. I know he wishes he could be here to, to address this group. Um, he just had uh, other obligations he had to see to. So I'm with the Office of Safety, and I know, I, I know with uh, FDA's presentation, they talked a lot about grants. And I have some information on grants, but largely I want to talk to you about safety uh, and what the Office of Safety has has going. Um, really, a, a couple weeks ago, I had someone do a project for me and look at what the, what the history of, recent history, has been in safety. Looking at train incidents and looking at employee on duty fatalities. Compared to 2000, we're down 50% in employee on duty fat injuries and fatalities. And compared to 2004, train incidents were down 34%. That's a good story. But I don't think it's a, it's a fair one right now. I think we, if you look back 18 years or 19 years, I don't think it's a good comparison. So you look back just 10 years, and now what you see is everything's sort of leveled off, both train incidents and employee uh, on-duty fatalities and injuries. In fact, train incidents are trending upwards ever so slightly. So that makes me, and that makes me ask the Office of Safety and ask industry, how do we get to the next level, right? Now we can't keep doing the same thing and expect things to improve. So what's the next level for us? Or what, what do we need to do to take it to the next level and get that downward slope on, on all these uh, incidents? Well, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about two things. Innovation or, technolo or technology implementation and partnerships with industry. So I can't, I can't start a discussion on innovation or technology without talking about PTC. So I do want to give you an update on where we are with PTC. Uh, 2018, as you all know, or many of you know, that was a challenging year. We had a, we had a end of the year deadline we had to meet, and we did. 
Um, so kudos to everyone uh, for getting that done. And that deadline was getting to revenue service demonstration. We also have four railroads that are complete and fully implemented. Um, and the 37 railroads have approved alternate schedules with a now completion date of 12-31-2020. Looking this year and into next year, um, what's, what needs to get done? We have to finish our testing, submit safety plans, and obtain a PTC certification. We have to um, activate PTC on all required routes and complete interoperability testing. And that means seamless, seamless operations with tenants and neighboring railroads. So as, for, as of first quarter of this year, that's the uh, 31st of March, 48,000 route miles are complete. That's 83% of the total 58,000 miles. Uh, 13 railroads are certified. 25 railroads need to submit their safety plans. 38 out of 227 interoperable relationships are complete. And those interoperable relationships are the tenant railroads and the neighboring railroads. So the key risks right now that we're looking at is interoperability. There are over 100 class two and three tenants that must equip and test to be interoperable. The supplier and technical quality challenges is an ongoing thing and delays due to lengthy testing. So what has FRA done? What's been our part on this? Two of, uh, two of six collaboration sessions are complete. I'm sure some of you have partaken in those or have been a part of prep preparing for them. Meetings, uh, we're, we're gonna be meeting with the class two and three tenant railroads this summer, all of them. And that this, as you know, if you've been a part of these meetings, our administrator takes an active role in those meetings. Uh, we have to support the streamlining of PTC system uh, safety plans, so the, the review and approval of them. And we have to, uh, we, we provide direct support out in the field uh, during the testing. So PTC obviously is an is a in incredibly important effort and initiative. It's number one on the administrator's priority list. Um, and so we, we continue to push that. Um, and I certainly couldn't come here and not talk about PTC. So some of the other technology uh, or uh, innovations, you know, the, re the Railroad Safety Advisory Committee was recently rechartered, um, and one of the first things the rechartered RSAC did was um, approve the uh, Passenger Rail Safety Group, Working Group. Um, and the idea there, there were, there were five others that we approved, but I'm gonna focus on this one. And um, it's, in, it's important to know that, you know, the RSAC previously um, has been, you know, focused on rulemakings and, you know, in some respect we still are, but we're, we're looking to hear, you know, we're looking to work through issues at, at, the, at the committee level. Uh, but the passenger rail safety group is all about technology and implementing that, helping implement that technology. Devin Rouse, who's here with me, um, and Michael Hunter, uh, Devin Rouse is our passenger rail staff director. He's, he leads that uh, working group, and Michael Hunter, who's with our chief counsel's office, uh, supports him in that effort. So it's really important that the that RSAC working group uh, be well attended and bring your ideas. Uh, I think we're, we're looking for ways to make the regulations more uh, technology friendly. Uh, we understand that sometimes our rules can really prohibit the implementation of technology. So we need to find a way to write those smart regulations that achieve both safety and allow for uh, technology implementation. Uh, pilot programs. We're supporting a number of pilot programs. Um, most of these are, or pilot programs and test waivers, most of these are on the freight side, but it's interesting to note. Uh, we have automated brake inspections um, and that's being, a, in, in one of the freight railroads, we have automated track or, or rail integrity, and that's internal rail flow inspections and track geometry inspections. So these are all the, the, the pilot programs we're looking at to, to uh, really, in, not just, it's, it's an efficiency thing, but it's also these, these um, inspections are pretty good. You know, they find defects at a rate, at a higher rate than what the human inspector finds. 
And this allows the same people, rather than go out and do verification inspections, they still have to do it in some cases, but they're out there making the repairs. So that's, a, that's an important uh, issue or initiatives that we have. Um, alternative fuels, we talked about that earlier. We have a program that uh, works with the industry to uh, try pilot programs for alternative fuels. We have a process in place. Devin Rouse spoke about that earlier today, but on our website, there's a, uh, a letter from FRA to industry saying if you want to if you want to implement a, a pilot program or you want to try a pilot program, there's the steps to do so. Uh, waivers. It's important to know that you know waivers. We can have test waivers. I talked about some of the pilot programs, and they're on test waivers. It's important when you come in for waivers, you make a strong safety case. The safety board. Um, I'm on the safety board. Devin's on the safety board. Uh, two other folks in our group are on. Uh, make up the safety board, and the first thing we look for is a strong safety case for, for justifying approval of those waivers. Um, another, another really a key thing that I know FRA needs to deal with, and I imagine your, your, your folks on the railroads need to, is how do we, how do we deal with all the data we're going to gather? As we're modernizing, we have PTC, we may have these automated inspections, a lot of data. How do we deal with that? What does the da data mean? How do we use it and, uh, to make decisions? And then further to that, what's the next generation of railroad employees look like? What's the next generation of FRA employees look like? We're, we're thinking about that right now. As we, as we consider uh, everything that's happening, the data that we're going to be receiving and the technology that's being implemented, we need to be thinking 10, 5 to 10, 15 years ahead. What, what is the expertise we need as we go out and do our enforcement and outreach activities? So that's the, the, the technology side. Now I want to talk about the partnership, partnerships. One of the, one of the really important things that we have um, going for us right now is our confidential close call reporting system. It's a, little, it's a small program. Just, I think we have 11 properties um, that are involved. Uh, but there have been great strides that these 11 properties have made. Uh, we believe it's a successful program. And it's very much a partnership between labor management and FRA. Um, this is one we believe in. We know that it not only improves the safety of our, the workforce, it also improves the efficiency of the railroad system. So we, you know, that, that program is important. It shows that what can be done when, we, when we're working together to achieve that, that goal. It's, it's also important to realize, and this is something I stress with, I was at the C3RS users group last week, one of the things I've impressed upon them is how important these reports are. So if something happens, make it a solid report. This is not a get out of jail free card. And sometimes it's being used that way. We understand that. But we, we can't allow those types of one off to couple of couple of issues prevent this program from, from succeeding and growing. On the same line, there's also disputable, disputable incidents when you know, a railroad may think it's not covered by C3RS, an employee does, and then there's, there's some back and forth and some bickering, there's threatening of coming out of the program. What we want, we, we can't allow that to happen. We need to work together between FRA, management, and, and, and labor, and realize that these one or two incidents are not worth condemning this, prod, this program, which is, which is could be so effective if everybody, uh, if it's executed correctly. Statement I made is 15 years from now when I, when I uh, retire, I'm hoping we're having a conversation about a, a really an, a, a, an achievable goal of zero, zero fatalities and zero injuries in the railroad industry uh, because of the success of the, of the C3, in large part because of the C3RS program. Another thing I'll mention is we have a, a pilot program that's modeled off of FAA's, uh, an FAA program where they have shared data over years and years and years uh, with management and labor, and they come together and they identify trains. They do trends. They do analysis um, of all the data, work together, and try to, again, identify these trends and non-regulatory means to address the risk posed by those trends. So this is something we're going to try in FRA. If it can work for FAA, there's no reason why it can't work for FRA. So we have, we are trying to build a pilot program. Some of you may have been involved in some of the meetings. 
This is an important initiative. Um, it's important. The, mo the hardest part about this is trust. I think anything with the partnerships um, is the trust, the trust between all three parties who are involved, labor, management, and of course us. We, we need everybody to trust that we're not going to take action on the data that we get. And we also need them to trust that we can protect the data. We're working on, we're making sure we can do that because we don't want people, we do, we do not want that data to get out into the, the public, the, into the public and people make their own interpretations or use it for bad reasons. Um, so anyway, this is a, this is a huge, a, a huge positive, um, there's huge potential here. And so we're working our way through that. So I've talked about, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, you know, again, for, for us and for the Office of Safety, innovation and technology implementation along with partnerships are the way forward for us. And um, we, hope you, you, we hope you'll join us. We hope you, you, you'll see the benefit. You know, we'd love to talk to you about the C3RS and the, and the rail information sharing environment. I don't even think I said the name of that pilot program. That's what it is, rail information sharing environment. We call it RISE. Um, so we, we, uh, we look forward to talking to you about that. Um, so I'll stop there and take any questions you might have. Thank you, Carl. There you Thank go. you, Carl. Sure. Um, SEPTA is a C3RS member, um, maybe one of the more recent ones, but uh, I know that our people are really uh, happy with the experience uh, so I can I can vouch for you know how great a program that is um, I would also just like to start out by you know thanking the FRA for the the help uh, with all the commuter agencies meeting uh, the statutory uh, deadline at the end of 2018 it was it was a lot to do uh, I think the the increase in meetings um, even the administrator, before he was the administrator, meeting with us uh, individually, um, there was really a, a, a strong push at the end, uh, 17 and 18, uh, to make sure that all the commuter agencies uh, understood what was required and, and, and assistance that was needed and clarifications. And so I thought that you know the FRA did a did a great job in helping us, um, and. Um, our industry, it's 18 times safer to take the train than to drive, but we very much know that getting that number even higher uh, is going to be great. So getting PTC for all of us uh, is extremely important. Um, it's going to be a very busy next 18 months. Um, I uh, chair the PTC subcommittee for APTA. We met the other day. Um, we had 17 of the commuter uh, railroads uh, report in, and for the most part, I, I was very happy with what I was hearing. So um, it's, it's, there's a lot of work still to do, but there's a lot of people out there working. Our industry is spending over $4 billion to make PTC happen. Um, and I, I just, you know, I know that uh, with one of the big things we talk about is the amount of paperwork and things that are coming. I mean, there's, there's 15 properties in revenue service demonstration, four in field testing right now. This has got to be putting a tremendous pressure on the FRA. And I know that you've added resources. Um, do you feel that those resources are, 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 are holding up? And, and I think it'll probably get even tougher as we get closer to the, uh, to the end of 20. So how do you feel about the, this situation? Well, I think. Thanks for that question, and um, I, I do believe that the resources that we have right now are holding up, but um, as I mentioned in my re remarks, we're expecting a lot more safety plans to come in, and as yeah. they come in, um, you know, we have, we have budgeted to bring on more staff, and we, we do plan on staffing up because we know that staying in front of this and, and keeping those safety plans moving through the process is vital to, to you guys um, getting to the point where you have a certification. So. Right now we're holding up and, and we are looking to the future um, and next year and beyond for that. Yeah, I, I know that our own experience at SEPTA has been good um, and uh, you know, we, we've really, it really helped us to move very quickly uh, on PTC and you know, we've, been, we've been operating for quite a while 
just uh, that pesky interoperability issue <laughs> still hangs out there on us. In terms of you know, the future for PTC, um, we're all getting a little bit of uh, uh, taste of reality of the, the ongoing operations and maintenance costs. Some of those mm -hmm. that are already out there running it, it is uh, a significant cost. I think the other thing that's going on right now for us is seeing the opportunities now to go beyond PTC 1.0 and go to a, you know, to a 2.0. Uh, and, and really, technology, we have to keep moving. So I, I know the administrator talks about the future and, and how PTC has to evolve. I'm just interested in some of your thoughts as we go forward, uh, even past 2020. Yeah, you know, I, I think right now the, the, the focus on is, is 20, you know, is, is the deadline, is to get to that point. Um, and we understand that the railroads are going to continue to innovate. Um, this this uh, PTC provides a great platform for in innovation. Um, and, you know, we, we need to fully su support that. Um, and... Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're gearing up. We're, it's important for us, FRA, you know, the, uh, the railroads move a lot faster than we do. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody out there. Um, that um, a, a, as they're innovating, the key for us is to try to keep up with those innovations, um, to stay in close contact with, uh, with the railroads to know, to know what's happening. Um, I, and I would, I would certainly encourage everybody for those for those folks who are looking to to your point jeff of what's it going to be what's the next step um, i would i would look to the folks who have implemented or fully implemented uh, in ptc and speak with them and find out how they're doing right now um, i think it's it's good to look that next step but i think we need to make sure we get to we need to get ptc 1.0 uh, implemented and i think there's some resources out there uh, you know, for the railroads that are, that are implemented and talking to them and finding out how they were successful. I think there's a lot to learn there. Yeah, I, I know one of the things we've done, and I know Metrolink has done it, you know, we've, we've brought the speed down at the bumper. Uh, we can bring it down to, to five and probably in the future even lower. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we have some cross-track boarding scenarios. We're working on how to use PTC for that. So there's a lot of different things uh, that we're seeing. Um, and I, and I, I heard you, you know, about plateauing. Um, I think our industry, um, we have a lot of discussions now after the experience of having a mandate. We would like to be more proactive uh, and we really wanna help you get past that plateau, uh, the FRA. So, We've been talking a lot about the, the I think it's 95% of the fatalities are grouped by either suicides, trespasser, or grade crossing incidents. That's where a lot of the uh, 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 activity happens regarding unfortunate loss of life. And so we're talking a lot about that, where you know, it's, it's not an easy issue to, to uh, work or on the issue of suicides, but that's something that uh, I know Metra is working on. Uh, they've made some progress in, in reducing their numbers, and I know that other railroads are working on that. Uh, trespassers are, are still, unfortunately, a, an issue. We're working hard on that. And the one that I really think that we can uh, definitely make progress on is, is grade crossings. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're talking as an industry about, you know, how could we bring our grade crossings up uh, to a higher level of safety. I know that there have been a couple different uh, funding initiatives for quad gates, median divides mm -hmm. at, at grade crossings, different things. Uh, but I, I guess I would be interested in, in your thoughts about uh, the industry kind of proactively uh, pushing to uh, determine what, with the FRA, what best grade crossing uh, safety improvements could be made and then how we would uh, perhaps get some uh, additional funding dedicated just to that area. But that is something that we're talking about right now. Um, I, would, I wonder what your thoughts are on grade crossings. You know, that's a, that's a great question. Um, one of the things I thought of, uh, thought about, uh, uh, have been thinking about is, I think we have a, FRA has a 30-year-old research um, 
paper that talks about what are the different improvements you can make at grade crossings and what are, what's the benefit of those. Um, now they're old, they're, that's an old research project and we have plenty of, we have lots of data but I don't know that we have the granularity in the data to be able to really parse out, you know, what's the best combination, that's what's, what, what's that's specific what or what's, what, what, what we can do. So I think um, one of the, so yeah, that, that's a concern, uh, you know, that's something we need to work toward um, in, uh, I mentioned the RSAC was re, um, rechartered. One of the working groups is part 225, which is the accident reporting. So some of the things that we can bring up in that, the committee meeting or the working group meeting is how do we improve the reporting requirements so that we can begin mm -hmm. to collect the type of data that would provide us with the granularity that's gonna help us make those types of decisions. Um, uh, you know, but I'm, I, I would welcome the opportunity to work with you and, 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 and the rest of the, uh, the, the folks here and, and look at how, how we can best use the data that we have now. I mean, we have, uh, we have analytics capabilities. Um, you know, we have, we can, we, there are things we can do. We'd be happy to work with you guys and, 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 and try to figure out the best way to, like, use the data that we have and improve data. Mm -hmm. Funding. Funding-wise, you know, there, there are multiple grant programs that FRA has, um, and Chrissy is one of them right. that makes sense that you could uh, use, uh, use the, the funding from the, that to uh, help out or for implementation or to, for installation of grade crossing improvements. Okay. So. Um, now we can go to some questions from the audience. Do we have questions in there? Please go to the microphones. Uh, I'm Josh Coran, Director of Product Development and Compliance from Talgo, and you might anticipate what I'd like to ask, but I'm just going to ask if you can comment on the FRA's relationship with the NTSB. <laughs> That's um, for you, Carl. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not me. You know, it's, um, it's, it's a unique relationship. Um, we, we have made a lot of effort in trying to um, I don't want to overuse the word partner with them, but you know, on accidents, we work closely with, with them during the investigation. We share data, um, and we often, uh, you know, we, have, we meet with them uh, prior to recommendations. Um, in some cases, it depends on who the lead investigator is. They'll come to us with the investigations ahead of time. Sometimes, or not, I'm sorry, the recommendations ahead of time. Uh, sometimes they don't. Um, it is, um, it, it, it can be difficult. Uh, we, we meet with them even after the recommendations. Uh, we, we, you know, we, we try to be responsive. Some of their recommendations, as this group knows, are aspirational and very difficult to implement. And trying to close NTSB recommendations is difficult. We meet with them uh, at least twice a year to go over the recommendations that we do have, steps that we have taken, um, and if we plan to take no further action, we, we advise them of that and we ask them, is there another way that we can meet the intent of the, the recommendation? Oftentimes there is and we're, we're working toward that. Um, but we'd like to get to the point where, um, I'm sure you're referring specifically to Amtrak 501 recommendations that came out. We would certainly like to have had a conversation with them uh, prior to those recommendations coming out and let them know what the what the implications of some of those recommendations were. Uh, we haven't gotten there yet, but we're working toward it. Yes. Okay. We have another question? Right over there. Oh, okay. Uh, hi, I'm Lucy Galbraith. I'm the Director of Transit Oriented Development at Metro Transit in the Twin Cities. And before that, I was the manager of TOD in Austin, Texas. And I heard you talking about grade crossings. I actually was on a panel at a rail right-of-way conference some years ago. And as part of that, I had looked up a number of cases where the problem uh, appeared to be that there were trespassers on the tracks, but the problem was they had no alternative. And so since APTA has a sustainability and urban design standards team that has done a lot of really good work on transit access and walkability, and TOD is, of course, totally intersectional, so we think about everything. So I think perhaps we might have a way to work together with FRA to talk about specific uh, safety issues with at-grade crossings and trespassers in terms of looking at what are people's desire paths, as we call them, and how can we, in a sense, eliminate the demand for people to be on the tracks. 
So I would just like to suggest that as part of what APTA can facilitate. That, that's a great point because um, in talking about it, you know, everyone assumes it's, it's cars that are having mm -hmm. accidents at the grade crossings. And while there are, there are also a lot of pedestrian incidents at grade crossings. So, yeah, um, and, and, and I'd welcome that. I, I think that would be great. You know, we, we, report, we had a trespasser strategy report that we submitted to Congress last year. And um, I think what you're suggesting fits right into how we could implement that strategy, uh, augment the strategy that we have right now. So happy to, happy to do that. You know, re, please reach out and we'll, we'll, we'll certainly get, get the right people together. Well, I know people in the audience will be surprised I'm volunteering for something again. But I do know at least one case study where the teenagers were on a rail overpass to get across a highway because their high school was on one side and their neighborhood was on the other. And they literally had no good way to do it. And they knew the train schedules, except there was a train that wasn't scheduled. So, you know, these, these, there, I know there's some out there and I think we can work together. And so I know APTA has a whole committee with really good people on it. So. Excellent. Thank so, you. Thanks. Do we have any more questions? One more? Good afternoon. Um, since the issue of the NTSB and Amtrak 501 came up, I just, one of the many recommendations to come out of that NTSB report, I think actually the final report was out this morning, um, related to the FRA system safety rule. And I know that FRA has recently done some outreach about that rule and there was kind of an invitation for public input. Um, but I just wonder if there is, as of sometimes when there's a regulatory docket, uh, a schedule for landing, uh, landing the plane, um, whether there is an intention you know, to move to the next regulatory step and if there are dates or milestones associated with that. For the, for the system safety rule? Yes, sir. Right, so we're right now that, you, you know, we, we put out a, 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 a rule like if, that basically talked about, or we responded to the um, uh, petitions for reconsideration right. in that rule. Um, but we're, we're looking to, I think we're going to be, I, I don't know for sure exactly what everything, what's gonna happen, but there, internally we are working toward a, a for some solid uh, dates, implementation times, and, and when we can get that rule in, implemented fully. They're just not public yet, it's right. fair to say. Cool, thank you. Okay, um, I think that's an, enough. We've run out of our time, so let's give another round of applause for Carl Alexi. Thanks.